This lecture is presented by the Friends of Julian of Norwich, a membership organization for those who value Julian's writing and teaching. And if you'd like to know more about the Friends, what they do and how you can join, you can find membership forms either on your seat or available at the back of the church as you leave. On well, the subject of leaving the church, not that I hope, uh, I hope you won't, um, but uh, if you need to in the event of an emergency during the lecture, the main exit is the one where you came in. That'll be open. Please remain calm and follow the directions of the stewards. There is another exit on that side of the building as well in the event of an emergency, but that is the one to use initially if we need to leave the church. If you need to make use of the facilities during the lecture, uh, there are none in the church itself, but in our visitor centre next door, you'll find blues just as you go into the building. And I hope that afterwards, if you're able, you'll come next door to the Julian Centre, where you can find refreshments, a uh, bookshop, our anniversary memorabilia, and other things as well. It's particularly good to welcome this year to give the Julian Lecture, Professor Barry Windiat from the University of Cambridge, um, a lecturer and reader in English uh, and fellow of Emmanuel College since 1979. Okay, well, <laughs> where he's held many college offices alongside uh, making a significant contribution um, to the study of English, um, particularly uh, in medieval writing, uh, and has translated the book of Marjorie Kemp, this year being a significant anniversary year for her as well, and also this Oxford World Classics edition of the Revelations of Divine Love, which, and I, this was true before you came, was our recommended edition when people came to the shrine and is also available afterwards in the Julian Centre. Very good to have Professor Windy up with us today to speak to us uh, and then to answer questions at the end of the lecture. So do think of questions as he's talking uh, and uh, we look forward to a lively discussion afterwards. Professor Barry Windyat on Julian's Mind's Eye. <coughs> Thank you very much. Perhaps I should just do a sound test first though. Can people hear me at the back? If I, is that okay? Okay, I'll try and remember to, uh, to keep talking at that level. It's an honour for me to talk about the anchoress, Julian of Norwich, just a few steps from where we may imagine that she spent years in her anchor hold, pondering the implication of the revelation as she dates to May 1373. And since the two principal manuscripts give different dates for her revelations, either the 8th of May or the 13th of May, it's open to us to believe that it was on this very day, the 13th of May, 650 years ago. Right. Okay. Uh, let's start again. Um, since the two principal manuscripts, is that okay? That level? Since the two principal manuscripts, can people hear me? If you, could you put up your hands if you can, can hear me at the back? Uh, the two prints, I'm just kind of repeating myself. <laughs> two principal manuscripts. The two, since the two principal manuscripts um, uh, give different dates, either the 8th of May or the 13th of May, it's, it's open to us to think that this very day, um, 650 years ago, uh, Julian experienced those challenging and, and reassuring, um, ultimately reassuring revelations. Um, would it be possible for those who can't hear me to come and sit nearer the front, perhaps? Good idea. So, there are some spaces at the front if people who can't hear me would like to, to come a bit nearer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And there's always a tendency for people in my position to sort of start talking more softly yeah, as, they, yeah. as they go along, um, spirit ebbs. Um, and, and so I may start to talk more softly. So please do, uh, um, do remind me if I become inaudible. Julian is the first woman uh, writing in English who can be identified. And I'm talking today about how Julian, living in Norwich and writing from a woman's perspective, uh, may have been influenced in what she records seeing as a woman visionary by the visual culture of medieval Norwich. I'll be looking at the most visual of the revelations, the second, fourth, tenth, and first, 
before concluding on some characteristics of Julian as a woman writer and how her way of seeing in her mind's eye may fit in with this. Julian could hardly be bolder in understanding her visionary experience to affirm that God is as truly our mother as our father. For Julian, this understanding of God as our mother is an informing scene that unlocks her revelations. Julian sees the first kind of motherhood in God as God's creation all at once of all the souls of all those who will ever be born, and his uniting of those souls with the second person of the Trinity. The second kind of maternity is Christ's assuming of human flesh in his incarnation, thereby restoring sensory nature to its original relation with the divine substance. As Julian understands it, motherhood was in the role and nature of the Son as the second person of the Trinity before time began or any human mothers were created. So it's less that Christ acts like a mother than that mothers at their most maternal share in Christ-like characteristics. Not only did God become flesh in a woman's womb, but as a mother, Christ carries humanity within himself to term. And um, after the most painful kind of labor, namely his suffering on the cross, gives birth to us into life and to bliss, breastfeeding us with the sacraments. Moreover, since Julian sees humanity's redemption as always divinely intended from before time, and man's fall as therefore incidental, Julian never mentions Eve and completely ignores the whole misogynist tradition of blaming women's supposed guilt for human fleshly weakness and temptation. Nor does Julian bother to include conventional recommendations of virginity and chastity, or marriage and widowhood, as if to specify them would delimit women, where Julian's focus is always on humankind itself. So that's the stunningly independent and original testimony of a medieval English woman author. But here too is a woman who experienced visions and lived at the heart of a vibrant center of artistic creativity in late medieval Norwich. Um, the sophistication of the arts in Julian's Norwich is summed up in the dispenser retable made during Julian's lifetime and now in the cathedral. Those slender, edgy figures have overlarge and pensive eyes that imply a great deal of gazing and thinking. Next slide. But there are two humbler panels now in Cambridge of much the same date that are also illuminating. Um, here, Christ carrying the cross, um, and another one, please, and uh, Christ before Herod. They were found in the Edwardian period when an old house in, in Norwich was, was demolished. The top of Christ's head, bottom left, where the panel has been broken off, shows that these two panels are part of a larger composition in which the figure of Christ appeared repeatedly in the same plane. And this puts me in mind of Julian's short text with its continuous montage of visions which have not yet been separated out from each other and demarcated. Might what Julian records seeing in her revelations have been shaped and even prompted by what she may have seen around her in the visual culture of her time. No one is talking about direct influence from surviving artworks, uh, not least because many potentially relevant artifacts post-date Julian's lifetime, but we're talking about more subliminal convergences in artistic conventions and associations with traditional iconography, which would still apply in works later than Julian's lifetime. In her short text, Julian affirms her faith in the likeness achieved in the painting of crucifixes as far as human imagination may attain. But in practice, Julian evidently longed to see more, and her revelations begin when she sees the painted artifact of a crucifix begin to bleed. As such, Julian's visions can have for us a kind of filmic quality because they are dynamic in focusing on movement and process and change. They can be photographic in their startling close-ups with sharply delineated edges. And beyond this, 
Julian's method for meditating on what she has seen works through detailed scrutiny and analysis of images, sometimes a kind of art criticism. For Julian, paintings now move and stream with flows of blood in a way that is perhaps alert to the experiences of women. Early on in her revelations, longing for more certainty, Julian aims to authenticate her revelation by explicitly aligning her vision with a celebrated artifact. Julian's second revelation, you remember, perplexes her, and she doubts if it can actually be a revelation. She sees the two halves of Christ's face alternatingly covered with dried blood. This discolored, darkened face makes her think of the relic of St. Veronica's veil in Rome. This is the image of his face that Christ left imprinted on the veil with which Veronica wiped his face on the way to Calvary. So Julian equates her revelation with this miraculous likeness of Christ's face uniquely vouchsafed to a woman. And Julian implicitly lays claim to some of its authority for herself. Julian has evidently heard how the relic in Rome can fluctuate bafflingly in appearance, not unlike her own vision. Julian could well have observed this variation in contemporary replicas of the Veronica. Uh, here is one um, showing Christ's face as beautiful, and um, here is one which um, reflects back to us our human blackening by sin. Very heavily restored, of course, um, but one can get the idea of what uh, the image once was on the screen at, at North Creek. If Julian comes to authorise her vision of Christ's face by thinking of it in parallel with St. Veronica's miraculous image, Julian may therefore implicitly identify herself with Veronica. And Veronica, in turn, in the Middle Ages, was commonly identified with the Himorissa in the Gospels the woman suffering with a 12-year issue of blood, and hence regarded as unclean, whose issue of blood Christ heals because she believes she need only touch his garment to be cured. Julian later alludes to this miracle when she writes, touch we him and we shall be made clean, suggesting how much she identifies with this hemorrhaging and suffering woman. And she does so in the 77th chapter, where she also exclaims, this place is prison, which has been read as an autobiographical frustration about her own enclosed life as an anchoress, although it may, of course, refer simply to all earthly life. Flows of blood also suffuse Julian's fourth revelation, which may have its visual germ, um, rather hazy slide, I'm afraid, may have its visual germ in late medieval devotional images that depict Christ as if smothered with multiple bleeding wounds from his scourging. Um, smothered like a rash, really, you can see all, all over um, the cuts. Um, incidentally, the, the gentleman the Christ, just to our right, uh, Christ, is wearing a very smart and fashionable hat. It would have been all rage in 1405. <laughs> <laughs> beard, apparently, was how um, everybody had their beards in 1405. <laughs> they were um, in hipster mode. Um, <laughs> Julian's vision, of course, takes such images much further, seeing the saving blood streaming through the fold firmament of earth, heaven, and hell. Another one, too. Um, um, but you can see, this, I just wanted to show you again the, the this is from the Sixth Glass, but as you can see, um, uh, the wounds carry on all over his body, um, like, like a rash, as it says, like measles, um, covering the, 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 the body. Um, in Julia's revelation, though, it's the blood rather than the person who harrows hell, cleanses earth of sin, and ascends into heaven. It's an astonishing vision um, of the power of Christ's saving blood. But when the blood reaches the point where it should have overflowed, it vanishes. It's as if the observed vision has a distinct edge, like a picture frame, or, or nowadays a screen. While Julian contemplates this, it occurs to her that if it weren't confined to a vision, the sheer volume of blood would have so saturated her sickbed 
that it would have flooded and overflowed. So the cosmic vision of blood's transformative power goes along with the woman's visionary nightmare panic about what would happen if there was some kind of an unstaunchable bleeding beyond her control, presumably because if you were an anchoress, issue of blood and heavily blooded bedclothes might represent a, an embarrassment, a, a, even a humiliation uh, to be dealt with. It's noticeable that in some of Julian's other passion revelations, that she later decodes their details as revealing how Christ is our mother. Julian's eighth revelation is a forensic close-up of the dehydrating of Christ's body during the crucifixion. There was a view that since Christ's fleshliness came only from his mother, his flesh was therefore more sensitive than it was for a man with two human parents, with the consequence that Christ's capacity to suffer on the cross was all the greater. Julian's focus on the drying and dying body is responding to Christ's words from the cross, I thirst, which Julian later comes to understand as a spiritual thirst or love longing in Christ as our mother to give birth to us all into salvation. On one level, the revelation's comparison of Christ's torn flesh with a cloth sagging as it hangs in the wind is the observation of a woman who had grown up alongside the processes of the local cloth making industry such as the cloth drying on open air frames that took place in the parish of St. Giles in Norwich. But later in her text, Julian re-envisions all this photographically detailed physicality of Christ's dying flesh in terms of Christ's childbearing maternal world, for his ghostly thirst will never let him stop till all his beloved children are born and brought forth. In this rather blurry side, Mary is gazing intently at Christ's wound in his side, which is just in front of her eyes. And Julian's tenth revelation of the wound in Christ's side may also develop a cue from medieval visual culture, which it interprets as a manifestation of Christ's motherhood. This revelation begins with how our Lord looked into his side and beheld and by this gaze, he leads Julian's understanding through his side wound to within his side. This Christ, who has the opportunity to look into his own side, can only be the dead and resurrected Christ of the familiar medieval image of the man of sorrows, where Christ, depicted with his wounded side and hands, stands in his tomb chest, surrounded by items associated with his passion. This is a, a very humble example from a very work-a-day, humble book of ours. The man of sorrow's image is a kind of visual epitome of the passion, the devout contemplation, independent of the scriptural narrative. And it's tempting to see this as lying behind Julian's revelation of Christ's gaze into his side especially as in some man of sorrow's images, here in a woodcut, Christ, by gazing down to his side wound, seems to guide the looking of the observer, just as Julian describes Christ doing at the start of her tenth revelation. The other visual motif behind this revelation well, may well be the stylized depiction of the wound in Christ's side, often pictured in close-up, along with the wounded hands and feet, as the focus here in the middle at the bottom, the devotional contemplation among the instruments of the passion, another form of epitome for meditating on devoutly. This is the uh, Daboon Psalter, uh, which was possibly produced for the wealthy Daboon family of their seat in Essex, so on the margins of, uh, of what we now think of as East Anglia. In Julian's revelation, she sees Christ reveal inside his side wound a fair delectable place, which is so mysteriously expansive as to be large enough for all mankind that shall be saved to rest in peace and love. It would be a small step to imagine that beyond the kind of aperture shown um, as the wound in this picture, 
lies the womb in which Christ, as our mother, carries all mankind to rebirth in redemption. And since Julian is also mindful of the blood and water streaming from Christ's side, this mysterious inward space sits very much adjacent to bleeding and bodiliness. Meditating on her vision of penetrating Christ's side wound, Julian moves from a human mother's breastfeeding her child to how we may be led into Christ's breast through his side wound to experience a mystical illumination. She writes, the mother can lay the child tenderly to her breast, but our tender mother Jesus, he can lead us intimately into his blessed breast through his sweet open side and reveal within part of the Godhead. Julian's first revelation is rather special in bringing together a cluster of striking visual insights. The blood streaming over Christ's brow like rain pouring over a house eaves in a shower, or the little thing in the palm of her hand, which Julian understands to be all that is made, or Julian's understanding that we are as if enwrapped and enfolded in God. First, there is a vision of blood trickling down from the crown of thorns. And this is one of the Fitzwilliam panels that I started with, which gives a vivid sense of pictures of Christ's head bleeding profusely that Julian uh, might have known. It's streaming down, it's seen even um, over his neck there. Um, and it's very possible, isn't it, when and Julian imagines um, not only the crown of thorns, but she thinks that there's a sort of additional crown um, of his skin torn off and, and, and all over the crown of thorns. And um, if it has a crown of thorns as vicious as that one, um, it's easy to imagine uh, imagining that second garland of dried skin um, a, a, as well. But the vision of the trickling blood in the, in the first revelation leads on almost immediately into a revelation of the Trinity, which seems to make the same close connection as in the familiar iconography of the throne of grace, um, where God the Father holds the cross with the crucified figure of the second person of the Trinity. Here's an example from the 15th century Antiphona made in Norfolk and now at the church uh, at, at Ramworth. My point is that the connection between the Passion and the Trinity in Julian is so closely and nearly made within Julian's visionary thinking that possibly it was structured and underlaid by a familiarity with this kind of Trinitarian imagery where the Trinity uh, and the crucifix, that's the leading side, um, are shown so closely together. But as with any of these possible connections with the contemporary arts, the vision of the little thing in the palm of Julian's hand represents a bold transformation of whatever stimulus visual culture uh, provides. Julian might see any number of throned figures of the deity holding in his hand the orb of the created world. It's not a very good slide. Um, at the bottom of the cathedral and at the top here, it's a figure of Christ sitting in judgment and holding um, a large orb um, in his hand. But what Julian is, has seen is that all that is made is in her own hand, which is, of course, infinitely more astounding and, and, and arresting, even if at some level it may be remembering and flipping round images of God holding the world in his hand. There may also be a distinctly female context for the language in which Julian attempts to give readers some measure of her insights. When Julian declares that this little thing that she has shown in her hand is the quantity of a hazelnut, she's using the language of medieval English cookbooks. For the size of a hazelnut was a common measure of the quantities to be used in English recipes. Take such and such to the size of a hazelnut. Or again, when Julian sees in her revelation how the great drops of blood fell down from under the crown of thorns, like pellets in their roundness, pellets, the word we still have, 
Julian is also using a term, pellets, that is found in medieval recipes. So here, as, as a, a measure, um, so here a woman author draws on the everyday measures of a medieval housewife's domestic experience in the kitchen to communicate something of immeasurable visionary insight. This first revelation also initiates a continuous awareness throughout Julian's text of welling blood and the visions of enclosing and being enclosed that implicitly reference Christ bearing humankind within him like a mother. The idea of enclosing, of a kind of mutual indwelling, stands, you remember, at the beginning and the end of Julian's revelatory experience in her first and 16th revelations. In the first revelation, Julian understands that God enwraps us so that we are as if enclosed within him. And this is a revelation of his holiness with us, the favor of his intimacy. In a highly unusual image, again in the uh, Ramus Antiphona, um, we see a quite comparable picture of the protective mantle of God. Here is the familiar depiction of God, the Father, holding the crucifix, but enwrapped and enfolded beneath God's ermine-lined mantle are sheltered a large number of the same. This is thought to be the only medieval English illustration of this subject of God's protective mantle that they surviving from, uh, from Norway. Plenty of images of Mary uh, protecting people under her mantle, but the image of God the Father doing this, which one could say has, Julian has in mind, is much more unusual. And in the climactic 16th revelation, which Julian views as the fulfillment of the rest, Julian sees Christ seated in majesty in the city of the human soul, and thus enclosed within us. So between these first and last revelations, Julian rings many thematic changes on these ideas. And this play on mutual indwelling, he in us and we in him, characterizes Julian's interpretation of what has been revealed to her about Christ's role as our mother in his incarnation. The most significant woman's body is Mary's, the most meaningful enclosure is the virgin's womb. And this is made extraordinarily visible by such contemporary artworks as what are now called Vierge Ouvrante, opening Madonnas. These are devotional images of Mary, where her belly is hinged to open like a cupboard, displaying the Trinity seated inside her. Perhaps not surprisingly in view of the Reformation, uh, no known English examples uh, survive. Uh, but there are accounts of some in English uh, churches. There's a, a long, loving account of a very uh, splendid one in Durham Cathedral. Um, as Julian sees it, Mary is also our mother, in whom we are all enclosed and all born of Mary in Christ's birth. Perhaps such very material emblems of how the material may enclose the immaterial could have informed Julian's explorations of indwelling. In an extraordinary passage uh, I put here, uh, Julian describes how Christ, enclosed in Mary's womb, took upon him our sensory soul, but then, in taking it on, having enclosed us all in himself, he united our sensory soul with our substance. So, himself enclosed in Mary's womb, Christ then encloses us in himself to effect the reunion of our soul's two parts. Indeed, by cross-referencing her 16th revelation, Julian even equates sensoriness with the city of God and sees Jesus enclosed in our sensory being just as our substance is enclosed in Christ's soul that sits within the Godhead. Julian's dazzling play on mutual indwelling characterizes her interpretation of what has been revealed to her about Christ's role as our mother in his incarnation, which is to reunite, to reunite 
um, our substance and our sensory nature. Citing both her first and 16th revelations in support, Julian sees Christ as our mother in a kind of perpetual childbirth in which his eternally giving birth to us will never alter our enclosure within him. Quote, and our savior is our true mother in whom we are endlessly born and never shall come out of him. Moreover, Julian understands that at the end of time, there will be a kind of spiritual returning to the womb, whereby all his blessed children who are come out of him by nature shall be brought into him again by grace. Julian simply ignores the Genesis narrative of a man tempted by a woman who is subsequently scapegoated. For since Julian understands the Trinity as always intending to redeem humankind through the motherhood of the second person, Adam's fall was incidental, not causative. Nor does Julian mention God's punishment of Eve with the pain of childbirth. In place of this pointedly absent Eve, the focus is on Mary's womb as the enclosure within a woman's body where the future of mankind is resolved. Julian's striking independence as a woman author is underlined by some pointed silences and absences on her part. Her text includes no apparatus of references acknowledging the authority of other texts. Julian's work is implicit with learning, but it's now hard to identify with specific reading. Even biblical references tend to be allusive rather than word-for-word -word citations. So Julian simply doesn't engage with the familiar nervous habit of many male medieval authors who recruit the authority of other more authoritative texts by citing them to bolster their own words. For Julian, authority lies in the images and locutions of her revelations, and as a woman author, she is her own authority through authorization from the revelatory experience vouchsafed to her. Ignoring male clerical authorities, Julian instead substitutes a reference system whereby what she records herself seeing, hearing, and understanding becomes self authorizing through a system of cross references that crisscross her text. Julian's method enables the evidence of one revelation to become a contributory part of Julian's interpretation of another, so that authority is constructed through an overarching system of interconnecting references that work to strengthen each part and the whole. They thereby reveal Julian's determination to shape her self-authorization, not by reference to male authority, but in effect by citing herself. This self-referencing system could be seen to go back to how Julian develops the authority deriving from her original experiences described in the short text by constructing a commentary on it in her long text through this apparatus of interlinking cross-references so that textual format here becomes the outward expression of a remarkable woman's uh, autonomy. That same autonomy also lies behind how the text presents an implicitly autobiographical archive. It records Julian's various crises of confidence in her revelations, but these have evidently been resolved through her own meditation with never a mention of any clerical advisor's input. I wonder if a similar sense of autonomy operates with the dynamic between some of Julian's more visual revelations and their context in contemporary visual culture. Marjorie Kemp describes the effect on her of seeing a pieta in a church. But any influence from visual culture on Julian has been buried more deeply, along with Julian's debts to her reader, readings, sorry. The 15th revelation is exceptional in suggesting a kind of direct transference from a picture. When Julian describes seeing in her revelation a soul leaving a corpse in the form of a little child, she might be describing a painting she had seen, 
since this is conventional iconography for representing the departure of the soul from the body. Um, so here in this expression, as you can see, uh, the good seed on the left, um, his soul is being received by angels, and it's quite a shiny white petal uh, the baby. Um, whereas, unfortunately, the bad seed's soul is um, rather more uh, dusty colored, um, and it's been taken away by a scaly winged devil. Julian describes the child in her picture. It's like a dab of white paint. She describes it as whiter than a lily. And indeed, the souls of the virtuous are often, as I say, depicted as paler than the more discolored souls of, of, of sinners. Whereas at the close of her chapter about the Lord and servant, Julian appears much more uncomfortable with visualization. First, she comments, now the son does not stand before the father on the left side like a laborer, but he sits at his father's right hand in endless rest and peace. Yet no sooner than she has presented such a visualizable account of the Trinity, Julian moves in the very next sentence to deny any literal and anthropological or anthropomorphic understanding of such imagery of city. But this does not mean, she says, this does not mean that the son sits on the father's right hand side by side as one man sits by another in this life. For as I see it, there is no such sitting in the Trinity. Even so, Julian can hardly have been unaware that in contemporary iconography, like the wonderful Ormsby Psalter, which once uh, was in Norwich Cathedral, it was commonplace to represent the Trinity as identical figures, often seated side by side, as here. Indeed, Julian's denial could almost have in mind the many such depictions of the Trinity, and to be describing them in order to move away from them. It would seem that, yet again, Julian here avails herself of such visual conventions in order to represent the triumph of the sun as an enthronement at the end of the Lord and Servant chapter, but then carefully distances herself from any misleading literalism in such traditions of depiction. Julian's recourse to the parallels with the Veronica relic show how she thinks through for herself the implications of what she's been shown. And I envisage her similarly assessing all the startling close-ups and the unexpectedly angled shots of her visions in terms of how they relate to the more familiar and conventional images that she knew around her in Norwich. But if all this self-referencing suggests a woman author boldly constructing a self-authorizing apparatus that dispenses with male clerical authority, Julian's method also implies that the extant text that we have may not be far removed from a private working draft. Cross-references back to already described revelations make sense, but Julian not infrequently cross-refers ahead for self-authorization to revelations, particularly the 16th, which she hasn't yet described to her reader. All this may suggest that at the time of composing the long text as we have it, guiding a readership came second to working through the text for her own understanding. This text, I think, is still being thought through, and for Julian is her means of thinking through. It's as if the most current state of Julian's text is for her more of a map or a screen than a linear narrative. And she moves around it in her mind with a cursor. It's as much spatial and diagrammatic as linear and chronological, which continues to make it exhilarating and inspirational to read, but by the same token, not always the easiest text to read. In closing her book, as you remember, Julian declares this book is begun but it is not yet performed, i.e. completed. Unfinished and perhaps unfinishable, the revelations would never cease yielding understanding for analysis. One characteristic aspect of Julian's analytical method 
is how alert she is in her revelations to the significance of what she has not been shown. Julian's approach to negative or absent evidence offers a model for how, as a woman author, her text engages with literary culture through the implications of what Julian doesn't or cannot say explicitly. So if Julian doesn't explain her revelation of St. John of Beverley's forgiven but unspecified youthful sinfulness, is she thinking of his criminal violence towards women in one version of his legend, where he rapes and murders his sister while drunk? Julian doesn't say, she leaves us to think about it. Does Julian's acceptance of incompleteness of what she doesn't know or yet quite understand about her revelations imply that she hasn't sought or hasn't been convinced by any guidance from male clerical advisors who might want to explain it for her or edit it or control it. Isn't Julian's implicitly positive view of human sexuality and of unregretted bodily nature, a more independent-minded female approach that simply ignores clerical group fear and loathing of the human body, especially female ones. Julian is shrewdly politic when she outwardly disclaims any intention to teach as a woman author, yet her practice is otherwise. Julian's parallels between Christ as our teacher and every mother's teaching role, informing her child morally by correction and by upbringing, quietly but subversively claims back for the woman also the equality that I think Julian's understanding of Christ as a mother throughout her revelations so triumphantly affirms. So if you have any questions, I will do my best to, uh, to answer them. Thank you very much. There's so much to think of. At the back. Uh, not so much a question, more a comment. Um, the vision of the Christ I'm sure you're right, um, and you get much more sense from Kemp, don't you, of, um, because of course she's describing her life and her circumstances, um, much more sense of the, how the friars supported her life. Um, and looking at it around the other way, um, in a sense, how, support, how much that support that they gave him, the patience that they showed, uh, how, how much credit that, 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 uh, that is to them. And she talks of a number of impressive Franciscans um, in Norwich, in, in her experience and, and, and elsewhere. So yes, I, I would have thought that, the, that all, the, all the orders of friars would have been um, very supportive and, and very influential, um, both on the religious themselves, um, but also on, on, on pious lay people too. Um, I was really curious to hear you say that um, just looking at what Julian wrote as possibly being written more for her at that stage than for wider consumption. 
And I just wondered how well developed that sort of side of interpretation is. And if you had anything further to comment on that, um, the possibility that at that stage she was writing more for her own spiritual benefit. Um, the, the question for, for those who may not have heard it at the back is uh, my, my comments about uh, seeing the text as uh, uh, uncompleted. Um, um, I think in a way this is a, a conclusion of, apart from well, there are some characteristics of the text which seem like loose ends, of course, um, but it's also perhaps um, a thinking backwards from, from the fact that, as, as you know, there are no medieval copies. Um, of the whole, a whole long text, um, and all sorts of reasons could be could be put for put forward for that, um, um, but it uh, doesn't seem to have circulated very widely. Um, so maybe uh, maybe not many copies were were, were made. Um, and as I say, there there are this, there is this sense that it um, um, doesn't seem to have been. <laughs> In some respects, it, 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 it's not very thoughtful about the reader. Um, it doesn't seem to be primarily presenting it in terms of, uh, um, of it's not user friendly um, in, 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 in that in that in that sense. Really, uh, that that was really what I was that I was thinking. So just just following on from that. Uh, would that be true of both the short and the long text? And can you say yeah. something about the relationship, what what you think the author's intent might be? Or, because the long text doesn't reference the short text. Reference it? No, 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 no. The question is about um, the, the the short text, um, rightly um, rightly picking me up on the fact that the, uh, the, the, the 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 short text, of course, is a medieval text. Um, which claims to have been written um, while Julian was still um, alive. Um, although the copy we have is made some decades after Julian would have, uh, would have died. Um, I think what interests me about that um, is that um, the short text is still of interest um, when presumably a long text was available to those who were in the know. Um, um, perhaps because it is so much more accessible as a sort of digest of, of Julian's um, writings. Um, but the manuscript in which the short version is preserved is um, an anthology of spiritual writing, which is certainly not for beginners. Um, there are some quite learned and, and specialized spiritual devotional texts in, in that manuscript. Um, so, um, and it's thought to be Carthusian. Um, um, making. So um, in, in that sense, um, again, um, you think, oh, there's a medieval text of Julian's uh, short text. It was being circulated, um, but it was possibly being circulated um, by quite knowledgeable and, and uh, spiritually informed uh, people. Um, I should say um, that there is a medieval a, a text of medieval selections from the long uh, a text which survives um, a little anthology uh, made for in the uh, later 15th century, um, which has now ended up um, in the collection of Westminster Cathedral, um, and which was probably made for use by nuns. Um, but it doesn't reference Julian, it's just uh, absorbed into, uh, uh, into a longer text. And you can't tell from that that the author is a woman. So it's um, rather a rather intriguing legacy uh, in, in that respect, that it was being possibly used by nuns uh, who didn't know what they were reading had been written by, by a woman. Barry mentioned John of Beverly, and I just didn't understand the reference. Could you repeat it for those who know less about the text? Than... Um, yes, um, Julian refers to um, John of Beverly in uh, chapter 38 is it, um, with a number of other saints, um, and says that God gave her a, 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 an awareness of, uh, of these saints, including um, the John of Beverly, who is a, um, an Anglo Saxon um, saint, um, a northern, obviously, as the name implies, a northern saint, um, 
And so what is he doing in, um, in Norwich, as it were, um, in, in, in Julian's mind? Um, and it's a, it's a bit of a mystery because um, the life of the Anglo-Saxon saint um, doesn't give any reason why he should be an example of God's um, forgiveness or of God's um, uh, favour, particularly. Um, but there are some European versions of John of Beverly's legend where he has this rather um, regrettable um, history of, uh, uh, of violence against, against women. Um, so you think, so, so I'm intrigued, uh, did Julian know that she may not have known the continental versions, of course, but um, it's intriguing that, uh, that she includes him and says so little about him. Oh, a question from the gallery. Yes, yes. Hello. Uh, first, thank you very much for your, uh, your lecture. Uh, you spoke about the, um, the self-referencing way that Julian authenticates or validates what she's seen and then constructs her own interlinking structure to solidify her autonomy. Um, for those that in the 21st century, um, in kind of terms of personal ethics or psychology, there are fairly self-evident problems with exclusive self-referential validation. Um, and one of the things that you know, we experience here is um, uh, people needing uh, healing from time that the autonomy of others as far as self-referential has then impinged on them. But for the medieval mind, do you think Julian could actually conceive of herself in that exclusively individualistic way that we might now take for granted when she refers to back in a second. And if he could, what would she offer us as a way out of the problem of self-reference as a means of um, authentication? Um, I think Julian would, would think that um, the authority Came from from God, um, and 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 so the references that she is making to her various uh, visions are not to herself, of course. Uh, I'm sorry if I gave that impression, um, but to her accounts of, 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 of her visions, which she has to believe, of course, because it is the foundation of her being and, and her vocation, um, are are divinely inspired. So. I think that would be my, my way out of the circle of, uh, uh, of sort of potentially arid <laughs> uh, sound cha sounding chamber of, uh, of self-reference. When I meant self-reference, I meant references to our own um, uh, discussions of, of, of the various uh, revelations within within the work. Does that? Does that yeah, it, it, it does. I think, I think what, um, what struck me was the sense that it was, well, well, God told me to do X. And not have or not shown me why, but or, or dead. Um, but unless you have some kind of external reference to bear on that, um, you know, we should talk about feeds, for instance. You know, you, you, we assert that we should want to show this by a feed. So you think it has some kind of sense of some sort of external referential process is required. Otherwise, um, I think that's where kind of um, psychopathic kinds of behavior then begins to come. Um, it was really fascinating to see all the visual culture that uh, you're suggesting that um, Julian was exposed to. And I guess I've got two questions. One was, I don't think there was any reference to wall painting. In, and there's a very rich tradition of wall painting in the churches in Norwich and in East Anglia. So I think, you know, some images spring to mind, which I think could be quite illuminating of what you, you were talking about. The other thing that I had, uh, the other thing I was questioning was, um, is she remembering back to what she has seen when she's not an anchoress? Um, or has she got stained glass or salters or Antiphonas or whatever in the cell with her. Yes. Sorry, um, I asked a lot of questions. No, no. Um, the, the question was uh, A was pointing out um, the rich um, heritage of wall paintings, 
um, both in Norwich um, and particularly and also in East Anglia more widely, Nor Norfolk more widely, which I could have included in, in D, which would have obviously have included a lot of these kinds of, of, of images that I've been showing you. Um, and um, uh, the second part of the question was, um, was Julia remembering these things from before she was enclosed or how much would she have in her, um, in her cell? Um, I think, that, as you probably know better than I do, the, the evidence for uh, what went on in Anchores' uh, cells um, is uh, a bit contradictory. Um, we like to think, I suppose, of, of somebody in some whitewashed uh, a space with perhaps a bare, simple crucifix and no more. Um, but some of the accounts of um, anchor holes seem to make them sound like small flats um, <laughs> with, um, with gardens and... Um, maids. Pardon? And maids. Uh, well, and, and staff, yes. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, can I, where can I move into an end? Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, um, so who knows what the, the, you know, in, so in some of these cases I, 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 well, I mean, one can imagine that there were yes there might have been books and, and resources and, and Norwich seems to have been such an extraordinarily vibrant and thriving place with such sort a of rich devotional culture that one I, I wonder whether Julian's cell was really as, as, as bare as, uh, as, as, as some modern, modern accounts of them Make, make, make it sound so good. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so there's a lot of this work here in churches. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Still yes. Yes. Indeed. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Which which one would carry with one um, throughout life? Absolutely. Yes. People had better memories. Um, and uh, as you suggest, uh, uh, a lot of decoration of medieval churches would seem to us um, gaudy, uh, probably, um, used, used as we are to uh, much more severe aesthetic. Yes. Yeah. And you have to remember that we, um, the physical process of color and its light will I think you get this from Kent, don't you, too, yeah. also a sense of, of um, a culture of pious conversation and an exchange. Uh, and uh, of course, of support, mutual support, um, and, um, and and the illumination, yes, um, and um, and astonishing memories. Um, the Kemp's advisor, Alan of Lynn, had indexed the visions of St. Bridget of Sweden. Um, now, you know, to, even to have read part of the visions of St. Bridget of Sweden is quite challenging um, to have indexed them that uh, <laughs> yes. I'm really impressed by uh, by that. Yes. Um, we like to be useful. <laughs> Yes, probably no one here has had the experience of picking up the revelations of Julian on a station bookstore or something and not really knowing anything and just reading it and not knowing anything about, about the background. Um, and I, I, I find the modern academic interest in Anchorites itself quite interesting. I mean, there's a, fascinate, a modern fascination with this enclosed, enclosed as we would think, um, almost unimaginably, unbearably constricted and constrained uh, life, um, and has led to a tremendous fascination with uh, with the anchoritic life in uh, among 
academics in the last few few decades. It's true, um, and uh, which which, as I say, has to, in itself I find interesting. Um, but whether if one read it without knowing anything about Julian or the circumstances in which it was likely to have been been written, would one get a sense of that um, confinedness? Um, since there are no autobiographical, almost no autobiographical references to that confinedness, I'm not, I'm not sure how much we we bring to it, rather than that, that it comes out of the text. Whereas in some of the the prison writing that you're talking about, I think one 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 gets that sense from within the text rather more. And so, in a sense, I, I don't quite, I don't, I think it's an interesting connection, but I'm not not quite sure that the sense of of confined space in the text is, is, is quite the same, really. Yes, at the back. Yes, um, it's obviously very much more part of people's um, life, and um, there was a cycle in Norwich, wasn't there? And, um, um, and I suppose it was something that, as with as in Mediterranean cultures now, as in, in Spain and the Holy Week processions and so on, if you lived in the same town, you saw the thing done every year by your by your friends and and, and neighbors um uh rather poorly disguised as mary or, uh, <laughs> or or whoever and that must have affected your 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 sense of uh, of, of them um, um as the, you know the, the the people in contemporary dress in some of these so uh, the, these pictures i've been i've been showing you it's like like having a crucifixion with people standing around in jeans and hoodies and and so on which um which would Rather startle us, I think, if we saw a crucifixion in in in, in those terms. Um, but I think, from what judging medieval impressions of medieval drama from my own familiarity with some of these Southern European um, performances, Holy Week performances, and so on, um, I suppose it's the sort of processional sense of them which is most um, striking in the sense that. Uh, that everything is, is, is a procession. Um, and Julian's, Julian doesn't really fit very well into that because her, um, you know, so much of the Holy Week story or the Christian um, Christ's life story, she doesn't bother with, she doesn't, she doesn't tell you. She, this is so concentrated, isn't it, on, on the incidents that, that are highlighted. So that in, in, in that sense, it's not like, you know, sitting through the York cycle or whatever and going from creation to doomsday because um, so many things, um, no doubt they interested her, but they weren't the subject of revelation and therefore they, they, they weren't in, in included. But as with wall paintings, which have been rightly mentioned, I think there is this, this sort of sense of maybe, maybe, maybe wall paintings and, uh, and drama uh, gave people like Julian a sense that everybody knew the whole story so that they could concentrate and focus on, 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 a, on a part which they had been, which had been revealed to them for a particular purpose. I'm going to quote Owen to Clark Hell, though, as a footnote to what you and me previously mentioned um, in the end time, I think, maybe. Um, no less a character than Tiger, you would remember this, assures his wife after her being, and all shall be well, then, as ye shall see. That's Tiger's words to his wife on his own. Terrible view um, that we could say, or the most of the right, um, was written, all shall be well. And just not couldn't help but sharing that. No, it's very, um, yeah. very good to be reminded of, of, of that in the um, in the mystery plays, which are now kind of thought to have been performed on the Norfolk Suffolk uh, right. border, I think, in a, a kind, of, kind of processional way. 
Um, and, uh, and again, I think the, uh, the history in the later 20th century and 21st century of uh, the phrase all shall be well and yeah. the uses that have been made of it um, are uh, again quite culturally interesting about us as, as, uh, as well. So do we know about end time is before or after Julian? After. After, I think. I hope to see you. I mean, it's more just kicking in on the chronology of the drama. Um, I mean, you know, this is the problem, isn't it? If you say there are, there are lots of the bits of Julian that seem to be added to the next thing, it's a nice that there was drama going on in Zambia at the time that we haven't got them placed in the history of Julian. All should be well. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. I was absolutely delighted when you agreed to come and give the lecture this year. I couldn't think of anybody better in a year when we're celebrating Julian's revelations, uh, showings, and somebody who has spent so many years translating Julian for us and um, it is a, a well-used translation by many of us. Um, it's been wonderful to be just kind of swept up and dropped into Julian's world and immersed in her words this morning and um, I certainly have found it a great delight and Looking at your faces and the interest and the questions, I know that this is shared by the people here. Thank you very much. Um, I have a small memento of the Julian 650, just um, so that uh, you don't forget us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.